Hey there folks, my name is Matt, and on behalf of Hackaday, I wanted to reach out to you to share with you an interview I got to do with a very interesting gentleman, a guy by the name of Mr. Ivan Goddard. And I'm not sure if you remember, but a few weeks back we had done a piece on the Mill CPU. Well, Mr. Goddard is part of the founding team over at Out of the Box Computing, and they're the guys that are responsible for the Mill CPU architecture. So go ahead and have a listen. Well, I'm Ivan Goddard, and I'm with Out of the Box Computing. I handle the primarily the software side of the design. Um, opposite numbers who are um, the, the ones with the bolts in the ears are the hardware guys. And in fact, it's been very much of a collaborative process. Uh, um, much of the design does reflect a software emphasis, but um, that has to be tempered with the reality of what can be built in the hardware. So give me some background. So how did how did out-of-the-box computing actually come up? Where did the processor architecture that you're talking about with... Well, the original uh, founding team were the core architecture group at Philips Trimedia, but, um, which uh, Philips had a five-wide VLIW DSP, which went into every Philips television, and was originally done in the 1990s and was a brilliant industry-leading work at its day, and it had gotten long in the tooth. And uh, Philips attempted to spin it out into a new company called Trimedia, and for a number of primarily managerial and business reasons, that collapsed. Um, and at the end of the collapse, we sort of looked around at each other and said, you know, we can do better than this. <laughs> now tell me, where did the... Where did the background on the architecture itself actually come from. So, so how did you, wh where did the idea come from, the inspiration for the architecture? Well, initially we had no idea of a market. There's, it was purely, well, what today would be called a, a maker philosophy. We, 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 um, we knew it could be done better and we wanted to see what we could do. Um, and consequently, we attempted to start out to design the best possible um, processor architecture that could be done. By that point, um, architecture had been pretty static for quite a few years, and the underlying capabilities of manufacturing process and other things had gotten well past it, but for market reasons, there was essentially nothing in the market um, after the risk versus CISC wars. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that, that we could make something that was a whole lot better than any architecture then in the market. And so we started on that. And then we realized that there was, well, first, nobody makes any money in supercomputers. And we were obviously headed toward being a supercomputer. Um, but we also realized that, well, we had the background in the DSP world. And what a... The DSP marketplaces, the price points, the power points, and the performance points form a sort of cluster. Philips had products, Texas Instrument had products, but what you got for your dollar or for your watt was roughly similar across that category of, of chips. And then separately, there's this all this whole other set of architectures that went into laptops and blade servers and desktops and so forth that were architecturally extremely different, but whose price point was fundamentally greatly diverged from the price points we were used to in the embedded world. There's this chasm in the middle. So we realized, well, we're going beyond what the laptop desktop, your x86 power PC market is doing. But while that's interesting and we want to be able to do that, nonetheless, where the money is, it's going to be in this untouched market middle. If we would be able to take the power and performance characteristics of a DSP, but run them on the kind of jobs that desktops and laptops do, we'd have a barn burger. Interesting. Interesting. But to do that, we also had wanted to have something which was at the extreme high end, and then we want to fill in this middle. Sure. We're obviously not going to attempt to compete in, uh, against the, the, the existing products. But that forced us into having a family architecture. The mill is a family, like, a, like the 360 was a family, or over time the x86 has become a family. And that meant that we needed to have a way to have a single architecture that would work in both supercomputers, but also in every general purpose application. 
people ask us all the time, are you going into mobile? Well, uh, somebody wants to put us in mobile. We're appropriate, but we're not a mobile chip. We're not a desktop chip. We're not a server chip. It's a general purpose architecture. Okay. It does not go all the way down. The Z80s of the world are safe from us. Um, we're, there's fundamental requirements that we're just never going to be appropriate in a thermostat or a toaster. So, so let me ask you because one of the one of the defining characteristics of of some of the more common general purpose architectures, ARM is probably the ultimate example of that, is that they produce a core and somebody else produces the silicon. So is it your intent to produce a core or is it your intent to go all the way to silicon and, and do the distribution yourselves? We have an answer for that and the answer is real simple. Intel's quarterly dividend is bigger than ARM's annual sales. <laughs> Consequently, yes, we would like to be a chip company. Sure. The fallback option, of course, is we can be an IP house. Where are the greatest potential benefits in the very immediate term? If you were to go to market, say, tomorrow with a piece of silicon that had that architecture in it, yeah. that could perform the things that the mill CPU can, can perform, what's the first market that you go and attack? Well, what's the first... What is the first market to approach is largely driven not by technology, but by market and economic realities. A new startup is not able to tackle a large market. You simply can't get your teeth around it in order to take a bite out. This cannot be done for business reasons. It might be a perfectly apt technology, but you simply don't have enough salespeople, support people, what have you. It can't be done. So our first requirement is to find an entry market which is small enough that we actually can get our foot in, grow, go to the next level entry market and so forth. Um, as a newcomer, we're facing a whole lot of not invented here, the old traditional, nobody ever got fired from buying IBM. Um, we'll be facing all of that. Every startup does. And as a result, our, for an initial market, we need a small market who is willing to, for fundamental reasons to ta tackle something new anyway and which is technology driven because we're fundamentally a technology sale. If, um, if your current product is being solved by current offerings, you've got no reason to change. So um, we've got a number of possible candidates. We're several years from having something we can sell and with, you know, with pins, on the, with pins or balls on the bottom. Um, and it's speculation as to what will in fact be the first. And we'll be opt oppor opportunistic. Frankly, I expect that we will quite possibly wind up in some of the research labs, the Lawrence Livermore's of the world. Um, we are, in fact, a very good supercomputer chip. <laughs> Nobody makes any money in it, but those guys are willing to do anything to get more, and we are more. Well, so, so you know, that's a great segue into, into asking the question of what's the impact of the mill architecture on something like cryptanalysis or cryptography or these highly... Uh, complex mathematical things that normally we would do either an FPGA where I can throw lots of problems at something in parallel. You know, video processing is another one, um, probably more closer to the consumer space. Um, but what's the potential for the mill architecture in, in, the space like, in a space like cryptanalysis or cryptography? Well, analysis a fair amount, but actual crypto and decrypt things, you're better off with an ASIC because it is a well-established algorithm and uh, the ASICs exist and they will always be better than any programmable solution, us included. Um, on the other hand, analysis is a different story. Um, there you're not attempting to follow an existing crypto standard, you're attempting to figure out what he's doing. Um, where the mill especially shines is in uh, programs which are very heavily, con flow of control heavy, um, uh, uh, very heavy memory heavy, um, rather than algorithmically heavy in the sense of massive floating point. If your program would run on a GPU, 
you're probably better using a GPU than us. The kinds of things that we're really good on is income taxes, artificial intelligence, um, the AI side of games, not the graphics side of games. The GPU works just fine for, for doing triangles. Um, but, well, the reason why most modern games are full of uh, zombies is because the AI is too dumb to do anything except zombies. <laughs> and we offer an alternative in that. Um, the uh, Yes, w we do do a very good job with, with massive floating point and array processing where our numbers are, are much better on a per power, per cost or area of chip basis. But um, there's alternatives. And uh, because we're fundamentally, we've got the price point and power point of a DSP, we're not really that much better than the DSPs that you can get uh, from Texas Instruments for DSP workloads. Sure. What's different is that we can apply those to workloads that the DSPs cannot be applied to.